Hello to everyone from Geneva, headquarters of the World Health Organization. My name is Tarik and I welcome you to the regular WHO press briefing on COVID-19, monkeypox uh, and other global health uh, issues. Today uh, with us uh, uh, we have a number of uh, guests here in the room and uh, WHO officials online. I will start by presenting uh, our speakers in the room. We have uh, Dr. Tedros, WHO Director General, Dr. Mike Ryan, who is Executive Director of WHO Health Emergency Program, Dr. Uh, Sumya Swaminathan, our Chief Scientist, Dr. Maria Van Kerkhov is a technical lead for COVID-19, uh, Dr. Rosamund Lewis is a technical lead uh, for uh, a monkeypox, uh, uh, Dr. Rogerio uh, Dr. Roger Gaspar is Director for Regulation and Pre-Qualification. We also have uh, Mr. Tim Nguyen, who is a Unit Head for High Impact Events. Uh, we also have a number of uh, WHO officials online, uh, and I will introduce them after the opening remarks. So uh, just to remind you one more time that we have uh, simultaneous uh, interpretation in six UN languages as well as Hindi and Portuguese, journalists who are online, uh, please um, click the icon, raise hand to be, uh, to be put uh, in the queue for asking questions when we come to that. Uh, with this, I give the floor to uh, Dr. Tedros for his opening remarks. Dr. Tedros. Thank you, thank you, Tariq. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. As you know, on Saturday, I declared the public health emergency of international concern over the global monkeypox outbreak. More than 18,000 cases of monkeypox have now been reported on to WHO from 78 countries, with more than 70% of cases reported from the European region and 25% from the region of the Americas. So far, five deaths have been reported, and about 10% of cases are admitted to hospital to manage the pain caused by the disease. This is an outbreak that can be stopped if countries, communities, and individuals inform themselves, take the risks seriously, and take the steps needed to stop transmission and protect vulnerable groups. The best way to do that is to reduce the risk of exposure. That means making safe choices for yourself and others. For men who have sex with men, this includes, for the moment, reducing your number of sexual partners, reconsidering sex with new partners, and exchanging contact details with any new partners to enable follow-up if needed. The focus for all countries must be engaging and empowering communities of men who have sex with men to reduce the risk of infection and onward transmission, to provide care for those infected, and to safeguard human rights and dignity. The stigma and discrimination can be as dangerous as any virus and can fuel the outbreak. As we have seen with COVID-19, Misinformation and disinformation can spread rapidly online. So we call on all social media platforms, tech companies, and news organizations to work with us to prevent and counter harmful information. Although 98% of cases so far are among men who have sex with men, anyone exposed can get monkeypox which is why WHO re recommends that countries take action to reduce the risk of transmission to other vulnerable groups, including children, pregnant women, and those who are immunosuppressed. In addition to transmission through sexual contact, monkeypox can be spread in households through close contact between people, such as hugging and kissing, and on contaminated towels or bedding. WHO recommends target vaccination for those exposed to someone with monkeypox and for those at high risk of exposure, 
including health workers, some lab workers, and those with multiple sexual partners. At this time, we don't recommend mass vaccination against monkeypox. One smallpox vaccine called MVA-BN has been approved in Canada, the European Union, and the U.S. for youth against monkeypox. Two other vaccines, LC16 and SEM2000, are also being considered for youth against monkeypox. However, we still lack data on the effectiveness of vaccines for monkeypox or how many doses might be needed. That's why we urge all countries that are using vaccines to collect and share critical data on their effectiveness. WHO is developing a research framework that countries can use to generate the data we need to better understand how effective these vaccines are in preventing both infection and disease and how to use them most effectively. It's important to emphasize that vaccination will not give instant protection against infection or disease and can take several weeks. That means those vaccinated should continue to take measures to protect themselves by avoiding close contact, including sex, with others who have or are at risk of having monkeypox. There are also challenges with the availability of vaccines. There are about 16 million doses of MVABN globally. Most are in bulk form, meaning they will take several months to fill and finish into vials that are ready to use. Several countries with monkeypox cases have secured supplies of the MVABN vaccine, and WHO is in contact with other countries to understand their supply needs. WHO urges countries with smallpox vaccines to share them with countries that don't. We must ensure equitable access to vaccines for all individuals and communities affected by monkeypox in all countries, in all regions. While vaccines will be an important tool, surveillance, diagnosis, and risk reduction remain central to preventing transmission and stopping this outbreak. Meanwhile, although the COVID-19 pandemic is far from over, we are now in a very different situation to where we were a year ago, and we have learned a number of important lessons. One of the most important is that the most effective way to save lives protect health systems and reopen societies and economies is to vaccinate the right groups first. Even in some countries that have reached 70 percent vaccination coverage, if significant numbers of health workers, older people and other at-risk groups remain unvaccinated, deaths will continue, health systems will remain under pressure, and the global recovery will be at risk. This is not theoretical. This is real. COVID-19 deaths have been increasing for the last five weeks, and several countries are reporting increasing trends in hospitalizations following waves of transmission driven by Omicron subvariants. Last week, WHO launched an update to the global COVID-19 vaccination strategy, emphasizing the need to vaccinate the most at-risk groups, including 100% of health and care workers, 100% of older people, and 100% of those at highest risk. We continue to urge all countries to strive for the target of 70% vaccination coverage with a focus on target vaccination strategies that prioritize the most vulnerable, which is the most effective way to save lives. While vaccines have saved countless lives, they have not substantially reduced transmission. So it's vital for governments 
and the private sector to continue collaborating and investing in the development of new vaccines that prevent both infection and disease. We also need vaccines that can be delivered more easily, such as through nasal sprays or drops. Crucially, it's essential as new vaccines and other COVID-19 tools are developed, they are available equitably to all countries. In addition to vaccination, WHO urges all countries to assess and strengthen their readiness and response plans for future waves of transmission, including surveillance, testing, strong clinical management, and a well-equipped health workforce. Tariq, back to you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Tedros. Um, before uh, we go and start uh, with questions, let me just introduce uh, uh, WHO officials who are online and who may also uh, answer some of the questions if need is. We have Dr. Sosefal, who is the Assistant Director General for Emergency Response. Uh, uh, Dr. Kate O'Brien is the Director for uh, Immunization Vaccines and Biologicals. We have also uh, Anna, Anna, Dr. Anna Maria Restrepo, who is a lead on uh, Research and Development Blueprint. With us is also uh, Mr. Under C uh, Andy Seal, who is an advisor to the Director of WHO Department for uh, Global HIV, Hepatitis and Sexually Transmitted Infections Program. We may have some other as well who may join at some point. With this, uh, uh, let's uh, start with the first uh, question, and that will be uh, Shoko Koyama from NHK. Shoko, please unmute yourself and go ahead. Hello, thank you for taking my question. Um, on Saturday, the WHO issued a set of temporary recommendations in relation to the outbreak of monkeypox. But these recommendations are issued for state parties, and I couldn't quite get the recommendations for the general public. Could you elaborate the measures that the general public can take against infection? Thank you. Uh, thank you, thank you, Shoko. Uh, Dr. Rosamund Lewis uh, will start. Thank you for the question on what measures the general public can take to uh, protect themselves against monkeypox and also to help reduce and stop the outbreak of monkeypox. So the most important thing is to appreciate uh, one's own level of risk, to understand and to seek out information from reputable sources, from health agencies and from community organizations that are sharing correct information about how monkeypox transmits and about who's at risk. So the most important thing is to uh, really seek out what are the choices that we can make that reduce our own level of risk. So at the moment, uh, the people who are most at risk at this time are men who have sex with men in most countries in the world, not all countries, which is why it's also very important uh, to pay attention to what's happening in your local region, in your uh, city, in your country, in your area, and to reduce your own risk. This may include, uh, of course, sharing good information and also reducing the number of sexual partners, reducing uh, the exposure in places that may put you at risk, such as crowded settings where uh, lots of physical contact may take place, uh, among people who may be already at risk. There are a number of things that can be done uh, to reduce one's own risk. If uh, folks are going for a vaccine where it might be available, then it's important to understand that the vaccine takes several weeks to take effect and to generate an immune response, which means that someone who is being vaccinated uh, uh, against monkeypox also has to continue taking protective measures and making safer choices uh, during the time after the vaccine has been administered. Thanks. Thank you, uh, Dr. Lewis. Uh, let's go to the uh, next question. Uh, we have Kai Kufferschmidt from Science. Kai, please unmute yourself. Thanks a lot, Tariq. Thanks for taking the question. Um, two really quick ones. Um, it feels like this is the first time that you've um, you know, explicitly said that reducing the number of sexual contacts might be a good strategy at the moment to reduce the spread. I'm wondering whether you can elaborate a little bit on you know, how countries should handle this and what we can actually do to get the information out 
and 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 also you know we do know from a lot of history that changing behavior especially around you know sex is really difficult and with the vaccine not becoming available very soon it seems yeah i, I wonder you know how long this can be kept up even if people really want to do this uh thanks kai uh, do we have a uh, Mr. Andy Seal online, who would maybe start with this? Andy, did you hear the question? Yes, um, thank, thank you, Kai, for the for the question. Um, hello to everybody. Um, perhaps I, I can start. Um, it, it, it's a great question. I think there's a lot of learning from HIV, um, as, as you suggest in your question. Um, I think it's one message within a package of prevention messages that needs to get through to people. And we need to take a, a lead from how communities are also handling the messaging here. So I think, um, uh, for example, we've set up a, um, a, a um, community reference group that's already met four times, including representatives from all WHO regions. And they're also sharing with us strategies that are being led from communities. And this messaging around reduced partners is coming from the communities themselves. Um, clearly, um, this is, as, as you also suggest, potentially a, a short term message. Uh, we hope that the outbreak, of course, will be short lived. We hope that the other preventive measures in place will, will also support the outbreak to be contained quickly. I think the other the other messages that complement this are being very alert to symptoms, understanding what symptoms are um, that, that people should look for if they, they think that they have been at risk and seeking medical advice rapidly should they um, identify the fact that they that they may have symptoms so rapidly excluding themselves from sexual contact close social contact in that case is probably one of the most critical messages as well and we're also um, hearing from communities that uh, really advice around um, support to obviously those who have been infected is critical really focusing on stigma and discrimination quite broadly as well will be critical in 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 getting the the outbreak under control but i think the reduction of sexual partners is an important message for now um, we're taking a lead from, from communities on how to message this. And we're also, if you heard when the DG spoke, he also recognised that where new partners are and where, where people do have new partners, make sure you've got the contact details so that follow-up can be um, organised um, should should that be required, should, should somebody um, uh, develop monkeypox. Thanks. Thank you, Andy. I hope uh, this answers the question. So we can go to the next one, and that's Helen Branswell from STAT. Helen? Hi, thanks for taking Hi. my question, Mark. I want to switch gears to monkeypox, um, excuse me, from monkeypox to Marburg. Um, on Friday, WHO sent out a plan saying that uh, all of the contacts of the two Marburg cases in Ghana had been through um, their 21 days of, of monitoring and none had developed symptoms. But uh, we've since heard that there have been two additional cases, people who had been contacts of the uh, first case. So I'm a bit confused about what's going on there. Can you please give us some some up, an update on on what is going on in Ghana? Thank you, Helen. Uh, we will go to Dr. Fala. If he uh, if he is with us, uh, Dr. Fal, could you please take this question? Thank you, Tariq. Can you hear me? Very well. Uh, uh, thank you, Ellen. You are right. We have two additional cases of uh, Marburg in Ghana. First one is the wife of the in this case on um, the chat of the in this case as well. So this information we receive from from the country. They have talked about 180 contacts followed up, but we still have additional contacts related to the last cases. There are more than 40. It means that uh, all contacts were not out of the risk period. So the teams are working to investigate to understand better how these people were infected. Apparently, the child was infected by the mother, not by the index case. So, that's why it's really important to continue making sure that, you know, we have thorough investigation and making sure that, you know, all contacts are followed. This is extremely important because depending on the quality of the investigation, the ability to isolate contact, you know, be important to stop the transmission. And we are still having a challenge because the wife of the index case is still in a kind of 
prior camps and uh, the teams are working with the community to be able to isolate her. So the situation is still very difficult because you have three regions affected right now. Although the number of cases is not high at the moment, but uh, we need to make sure that every hotspot can be stopped. Otherwise, it will become more complex. So we are working very closely with the country, with partners to make sure that we can stop it as soon as possible. Thank you. Uh, many thanks, Dr. Fall, uh, and I understand that uh, Dr. Anna Maria Restrepo may add something on the Marburg research for vaccines and therapeutics. Uh, Dr. Dr. Rest uh, Restrepo. Thank you, Tariq. We have been working with colleagues and researchers and developers for over a year now in a consortium called Marburg. As part of this research preparedness efforts, we have now identified all the candidate vaccines and candidate therapeutics for Marburg. And we have been working in close collaboration with the developers. In addition to that, in collaboration with the NIAID, the NIH, and many other research centers around the world, we are in the process of finalizing protocols for the evaluation of these vaccines and therapeutics. We um, anticipate that by the end of the next week, we can have a protocol that could be presented to the national authorities in Ghana for consideration. We think that this is a good example of how research preparedness pays off, because before the outbreak, we already have the landscape of the medical countermeasures that could be used and the outlines of the protocols on how to evaluate and a very good collaboration from the scientific community. So um, we are um, expecting to see what this evolution of the outbreak but uh, we are ready to um, evaluate the vaccines and therapeutics if necessary. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ana Maria. Uh, we'll go to the next question. That's uh, Max Kozlov from Nature. Max, can you hear us? Un unmute yourself, please. Hi, thanks for taking my question. Um, Around a month ago, the DG supported changes to the naming of monkeypox or the uh, different clades of monkeypox. And I was just wondering if there's any kind of movement uh, on that or what next steps might look like. And if it's uh, too late now that the uh, there's been a public health emergency uh, declared about it. Thank you. Dr. Luis. Sure, thank you. I'm sure you're aware that there are three different things. There's the name of the disease, the name of the virus, and the name of the clades. Uh, the name of the clades is something that scientists are already discussing uh, through their research and in the scientific literature. Proposals are being made, such as uh, naming uh, clades one and two, for example, instead of using geographic-based names. Uh, for the uh, virus itself, the International Committee on the Taxonomy of Viruses has already embarked on uh, conversations with their orthopox virus group on uh, whether there will be any any uh, modifications to the uh, not only the name of the monkeypox virus but um, of course there are many other pox viruses that carry similar names that have been known for a long time so that is up to the ICTV to provide a response to that and for WHO uh, our responsibility is the naming of the disease uh, which uh, has existed already in the international classification of diseases for some time so there is a process that we have initiated uh, and uh, welcome all proposals as to what the new name might be Thank you. Thank, thank you, Dr. Lisa. Dr. Swaminathan, would you like to add something? Yes, just to add, uh, I think, to what uh, Rosamund was saying, that uh, the naming of diseases, uh, uh, there was a revised procedure that WHO adopted several years ago, essentially to, um, to overcome the, the previous, uh, you know, history of naming diseases by named by place of origin or where it was first detected or sometimes, uh, a, a, uh, you know, even a name of an individual, etc. So there, there are standard rules now on the naming of diseases and there is a call that's been put out actually for suggestions and then a committee will then consider those suggestions. So we, as far as I know, have not received any proposals for a, a name to replace uh, monkeypox. So, so that process is still open and uh, as Rosamund said, we welcome any uh, constructive suggestions. Thank you. And just to add, while all this has been done, <clears throat> for the vast majority of people who deal with these diseases, experience them in the communities, the, the name per se 
is not is not a major issue. It's the weaponization of these names. It's the use of these names in the pejorative. It is the targeted manipulation of the implications of what these names make. The name in itself, the names in themselves, <clears throat> the people of Marburg today in Germany, <clears throat> uh, the virus Marburg we're talking about now in Ghana is named after Marburg uh, because it was first discovered in a lab there. Uh, uh, we're, uh, uh, <clears throat> all of those issues around geographic representation, but I don't think the people of Marburg today are worried about the stigma of that per se. But there are certain words and certain trigger words that are then used and manipulated in other circumstances. And they're, bas they're basically, <clears throat> um, uh, frankly, racist connotations that come from some of this, and, it, and, and, and we have to call that out. Because names are names, no matter what names we use, if people are determined to, to misuse and to weaponize names in order to isolate or discriminate or stigmatize people, then that will always continue. We will do, as Sumya said, and I think the international scientific community has a job of work to do, to, to the extent possible to take that, those opportunities away. But that, that, that in itself is not the problem. The problem is the misuse and the, uh, of these terminologies around the world, especially when they implicate racial slurs. Thank you. We will go to the next uh, question. And just uh, to, to say that uh, we got a question from uh, Simon Martin from Radio France uh, exactly on this. So I hope, uh, Simon, you got the answer in previous uh, interventions. Let's go to NBC and we have Ben Ryan. Hi, thanks for taking my question. Um, as you know, there was a preprint that suggested that the R naught uh, for monkeypox might only be over one for men have sex with men, meaning that risk group would possibly be the only one to have an average transmission of more than one person from each case. I was wondering if you could speak to that and just the overall the quality of the risk for non-MSM, including women and children, you know, if there's any qualitative words you might want to apply to their risk at this time and looking forward. Uh, Dr. Lewis. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Ryan. So, yes, uh, you've indicated correctly that there's some um, suggestions, some modeling, and some publications are, are finding that R0 might be 1.6, 1.7, 1 1.8 in some European countries, where, as we have, as the Director General has already indicated, 99% of cases are still among men, and of those, uh, over 95% to 98% are, are among men who have sex with men. So the, the R0 is a property of, of the transmission of, of the virus, and also also, uh, the circumstances in which the virus might tr uh, be transmitted, and it is a property um, when there's no intervention. So if there's no intervention uh, in a circumstance where there's a lot of skin-to-skin -skin contact, uh, frequent um, uh, contact uh, on a regular basis, perhaps in the context of multiple partnerships or anonymous um, contact with anonymous partners, then that would be a circumstance uh, without intervention where uh, the uh, virus can spread more easily. Um, monkeypox virus has been known in the past uh, to have an R0 just under one, which is why in the past the outbreaks have been self-contained, um, generally self-limited, uh, and uh, shorter chains of transmission. Uh, this may be changing now also because of the uh, lack of global immunity to orthopox viruses in general, providing a more a larger susceptible, a pool of susceptible individuals who, who may, once exposed, may contract infection through lack of immunity. So uh, I think the message that comes here is that they're um, important to continue to emphasize uh, the choices that individuals can make to protect themselves. Uh, if the R0 remains less than one for uh, most people, then the outbreak itself will be self-limited. So it's, that's a very important feature. You did ask directly about risk for uh, women, children, and others who may be exposed. So we, we know very clearly that uh, one of the main modes of exposure for this particular illness uh, is through direct contact, close contact, skin-to-skin -skin contact, possibly even face-to-face -face contact exposure to droplets or virus that may be in the mouth. Many people have lesions in the mouth. And so that it's very important for anyone who has monkeypox to isolate so that they can protect also anyone else living in their household or anyone else that they may be in contact with. Household transmission is how this was first discovered. Um, and household transmission uh, is also, may in some circumstances, uh, begin to occur now. And so it's critically important that everyone understand that this is a 
disease that transmits through close contact and uh, to, to uh, make the choices that need to be made accordingly to protect themselves and other people. Yeah, thanks. I just wanted to comment on the concept of the reproduction number because we have um, such a educated public now, given the last couple of years that we've had for COVID-19. So Rosamond completely has, has provided an answer to that, but I just wanted to comment that this reproduction number is an average. It's the average number of infected, someone who is infected can pass the virus to someone else in a susceptible population. It's an average, which means some people may have more than that and some people may have less than that. Any R naught above one means an epidemic can take off. And as you've pointed out, we have one particular population, communities of men having sex with men, where the R naught has been estimated to be over one. That means the outbreak is expanding. And that means there's opportunities to bring that reproduction number below one. And so all of the ways in which Rosamond and Andy have outlined, and the Director General has outlined, ways to reduce the risk, to reduce onward spread, because monkeypox is different than COVID. You need that direct physical skin-to-skin, mouth-to-skin contact, as has been described. There's many ways in which that risk can be reduced. So there is an opportunity to bring the r naught, to bring that reproduction number below one in MSM communities with the right information by empowering this community, Activating this community to take control of the situation um, so that this outbreak of monkeypox in MSM right now can be brought under one. Many thanks. Uh, now we will move to AFP, Nina Larson. Nina? Yes. Hi, thank, thank you for taking my question. Um, I wanted to ask about uh, the two new peer-reviewed studies published in uh, Science this week that claim that um, the animal market in Wuhan was really the epicenter of the COVID pandemic um, and basically ruling out the lab leak theory. I'm wondering how credible you think these studies are and if they sh will or should uh, alter the approach to investigating the COVID origins. And um, I also just wanted to, uh, I just had a clarification to ask about the previous answers. When talking about um, reducing uh, sexual partners, I'm, I'm wondering, is it, my understanding is that uh, monkeypox is spread through uh, close contact, but not necessarily sexual uh, transmission. Could you just clarify if there is sexual transmission? Thank you. Thank you. Let's start with the first question uh, with uh, Dr. Van Kierkhoff. Yes, thanks, Nina, for the question. So these two uh, papers that have been published were actually available as preprints a few months ago. Um, WHO, our internal secretariat, uh, evaluated them, as did the SAGO, the Scientific Advisory Group for the Studies of uh, the Origins of Novel Pathogens, evaluated these papers, as they have done with all of the papers um, that are currently available, looking at how the COVID-19 pandemic began. So these are, these are good analyses that have looked at all available data um, that is uh, looking at the early cases, looking at where those cases occurred, the geographic distribution in space and in time, in looking at different exposures. There's another uh, paper that looked at the genetic sequences that became available and looked at the potential for spillover events that occurred in that market. Um, and then there was another, a third paper, um, which you didn't mention, but there's a third paper looking at environmental samples. So we, as WHO and the SAGO, were aware of this data um, as preprints and even before, because a lot of this was discussed and outlined in the March 2021 report of the WHO joint mission. Um, and this gives further information about what happened early on in the pandemic in December of 2019, in early January 2020. Um, it provides additional information that we have um, that, that is available, but what, for us, what is really critical um, and what critically remains is looking further within China, further within Wuhan and in, and in the markets within Wuhan about further serologic studies in the markets themselves, for example, among people who were exposed to animals that we know are susceptible to SARS-CoV-2 infection, to look at where the animals that were sold at those markets came from, so tracing back those animals to those source farms and looking to see what were the species that were sold and if any specimens remain to test those samples to see if there's any evidence of SARS-CoV-2 infection or antibodies, and then looking at the people that worked at those source farms. So for us, this does provide more information um, you know, around what was happening early days, but unfortunately it's, it's not enough we need more studies to be done 
um, in China and elsewhere to really understand the earliest stages. So without those serologic studies in the markets, at the source farms, without tracing those animals back, it still leaves some open questions for us. But they're good pieces of, of work. Um, you know, we welcome more scientific studies, peer-reviewed scientific studies, to help us get closer to understanding how this pandemic began. And remember, the, the goal is not just to figure out how this pandemic began, it's to learn how we better prepare for the future. So that work will continue because we will continue to have spillover events. We see this with even monkeypox. We see additional spillover that's happening in a number of countries. We see this with Marburg. We see this with a lot of pathogens with epidemic and pandemic potential. The goal is to learn. The goal is not to blame. The goal is to learn and to take those learnings to be better prepared. So the work of WHO continues. The work in countries um, for the studies that have been recommended by the SAGO continues. We as the Secretariat will continue to work with all countries to better understand and to further understand the start of this pandemic. Just briefly to add that like in all situations of origins, this is a scientific <clears throat> detective story that goes on. And each new piece of information adds to the overall assessment. And a new piece of information or new scientific studies can move more positively with one hypothesis or another. But like all stories like that, all hypotheses remain on the table until you can prove that one hypothesis is the explanatory hypothesis. And so it's important for us to remember that all hypotheses remain on the table. But we're very pleased to see this kind of work being done, which advances us and advances our common understanding of the origins of this disease. Thank you, um, Dr. Ryan and Dr. Van Kierkov. Uh, uh, Mr. Mr. Seal, would you like to take this uh, second question that was on the, on the transmission mode? All right, could you please remind me of the uh, exact wording? Thank you, and I'll be happy to. Uh, now, if, if, I, if I remember cor correctly the, the, the question that came, it was, uh, it was uh, the, the transmission, the, the, the transmission mode of monkeypox. Uh, is it a sexually transmitted disease? Is it close contact uh, transmission? So uh, there, there, there is a need for clarification on that. Thank you. Um, so we have convened um, uh, a number of STI experts to to look into this question, and uh, in short, they, they've uh, concluded that this is clearly transmitted during sex, and so they're comfortable in describing this as sexually transmissible. But they have not yet uh, felt able to reach a conclusion to you know, state that this is an STI. So they're looking at past experiences where there are multiple modes of transmission, including Zika, for example, and they're comparing um, uh, uh, different experiences um, for, from, from those types um, of, of experience. They're looking at lab data around presence in vaginal fluids and, and semen, of course, of, of, the, of the virus. Um, in terms of messaging, um, uh, I guess the, the one area where um, we, we might instinctively assume that we would be able to confidently say use condoms as a level of protection, um, we're not able to do that for, for, for monkeypox just because we know that it's that close skin to skin contact um, that, that facilitates transmission a little bit like herpes. Um, condoms aren't efficient in protecting herpes transmission, but other STIs, they, they are. So I think the, the critical um, piece is really focusing in on um, close intimate personal contact, prolonged contact that happens during sex as the key mode of transmission. And obviously, as others have said, we continue to interrogate the data. Thank you, Tarek. Thanks very much, Andy. So yes, just Nina, just to come back to, to your original question and to just to confirm and in, of course endorse what Andy has said, but also to uh, confirm what you suggested, which uh, yes, it is close contact. There are other modes of transmission, uh, not necessarily sexual transmission is required. So close contact uh, of skin to skin, um, which is why it, uh, health agencies are also sharing the information that while one group are predominantly affected and, and greatly affected at the moment. Um, it is very important for all of us to understand, to appreciate that anyone can be at risk. It's a very difficult message to put across. There is one group that is primarily at risk at the moment, and this is the group that we really want to get information to on, on how to protect themselves. But at the same time, anyone who is exposed to monkeypox can also be exposed. So while the risk to the general public uh, is at the moment uh, not as great, uh, it's important that uh, 
we also share the message that uh, it is possible to be exposed in a, in a setting where there are many people together um, with um, physical contact uh, and, uh, and that um, that includes a household setting. So um, some people are being exposed in a household setting, both um, in, in countries where this disease has long been known, as well as now in newly affected countries. Derek? Uh, Dr. Sominatan, would you like to add something to this? Just a very quick point uh, on, on transmission. We've seen that in some countries, uh, the Bavarian Nordic uh, vaccine is, has been made available. Uh, to, to some high-risk groups and, and also to those who've been exposed as a sort of post-exposure prophylaxis. I think it's important to remember that firstly, we don't have uh, the full clinical effectiveness uh, data on, on this vaccine because the vaccines that we have today are small, were developed for smallpox and we believe that they would work against multi, uh, monkeypox, but those studies need to be done and the data needs to be collected. But also it takes time to develop an immune response, and the Genios uh, vaccine, which is a Bavarian Nordic one that's been approved now in the EMA, FDA, and Canada, uh, is a two-dose vaccine, and it takes a couple of weeks after the second dose to really achieve full immunity. That's what the company says, and therefore, um, one is not protected a few days after taking uh, the vaccine. So this is why, again, to highlight that the safe behavioral uh, practices are, are really going to be very, very critical. And in fact, that's most important right now in reducing the transmission of this infection from person to person. The vaccine could be an add-on tool that might help, but uh, at the moment, we don't have the data to confidently say that the vaccine is the best approach to this outbreak. <clears throat> and just, I think Sumi makes a, a really important point because it's a bit like with COVID. Dr. Tedros was saying from the very beginning of COVID, we need comprehensive inclusive strategies that focus on all elements of this, on awareness, on diagnosis, on health-seeking behaviour, on risk reduction, on preventing onward transmission. Um, and we're seeing benefits of that now in communities where we see open, transparent communication and good dialogue between governments and affected communities. We're beginning to see positive signs. So that idea of having, there's no silver bullets here, and we have to be very careful. Vaccines offer hope in every situation. But vaccines by themselves right now are not a silver bullet. This is not a situation where vaccines replace everything else. Vaccines will come into play in very specific situations and may become very important. Right now, there are uncertainties around that. There are issues around how long it takes to be protected when you're vaccinated. Who should be vaccinated? What is the effect of the eff efficacy of these vaccines? What are the effective strategies? Is, it, is, 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 is focusing on contacts or focusing on risk groups. There are unknowns here, and the scientific community is working extremely well. Dr. Tedros has had uh, very high-level phone calls with other leaders of, of, of agencies like Gavi and CEPI and UNICEF to look at this at the highest level, to see how best we move forward strategically. Uh, and there is great hope in that, and uh, Sumia, you've also said that we need short, medium, and long-term strategies here for these vaccines, because there's an endemic situation with monkeypox as well. So dealing with this outbreak alone Alone. We need to deal with the long-term issues of countries that have been affected for decades by this disease. So taking a comprehensive, long-term approach to this but with identifying what we can do now to bring vaccines into play as part of a comprehensive strategy has to be our way forward. And again, because of these uh, uncertainties around um, what we don't know, it's really important we collect data along the way. This is one of these situations where collecting randomised evidence where we can uh, to ensure that we fully understand how efficacious these vaccines are and what strategies will give us the best outcomes for the populations that we're serving. Thank you all. Uh, we have a number of questions and I'm afraid we probably will not be able to answer all of them, but let's take uh, one or two more. Uh, we have Omar Yidis from Anadolu News Agency. Omar, please uh, unmute yourself. Uh, hi, thanks for taking my question. Uh, my question is about uh, vaccinations, actually, and and uh, actually, uh, the Dr. Ryan uh, told uh, us about uh, the special uh, circumstances. Uh, so, my my point is, uh, given the current uh, rise in the cases, uh, when actually can we expect uh, a mass vaccination campaign uh, in international level? Thank you. 
Dr. Lewis, please. Thank you very much. Uh, the WHO guidance, interim guidance, has been uh, on. It is online. It's been online since the 14th of June, I believe, and uh, it clearly states, uh, as Dr. Uh, Tedros also stated this afternoon, that mass vaccination is not recommended at this time. Uh, this is a virus which um, is is at the moment affecting a specific group of people, and uh, there are behavioral uh, interventions that uh, are effective, and vaccine. Uh, um, may also be effective uh, based on prior experience, um, but we don't have um, effectiveness data uh, for monkeypox in this type of outbreak at this time. So we are strongly encouraging all countries and all parties to uh, undertake uh, studies to collect data on effectiveness and safety of this vaccine, even as they're rolling it out where it can be rolled out for persons who are contacts who may have been exposed or for persons who may be at high risk for different reasons. At this time, there's no indication of a need for mass vaccination. Um, and uh, there's, uh, of course, uh, we remain open to um, how this outbreak will evolve. We hope it will not evolve. We hope we are still able to stop this outbreak through the combination of measures that are available, surveillance, contact tracing, isolation of cases, um, monitoring of contacts uh, who uh, need to monitor themselves for fever or development of other symptoms such as a rash, um, risk communication, community engagement, particularly engaging with associations and individuals who are themselves at high risk at the moment, seeking out support uh, from community leaders and influencers, and of course the entire package of interventions that has been outlined in the temporary recommendations that the Director General has uh, issued on Saturday for all member states and all stakeholders holders in responding to this outbreak. Thank you, Dr. Lewis. Uh, let's try to take uh, Sarah Jerving from DevEx. Sarah, please unmute yourself. Thank you so much. Um, today, Med Access and the Clinton Global Health Initiative announced that they negotiated a price of $1 uh, per HIV self-test. Uh, do you think that price is low enough to increase access broadly enough? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Andy, would you like to try to answer this question? Thank you, Tarek, and thank you um, for, for, the, for the question, Sarah. Um, I'm actually in Montreal at the moment at the International AIDS Conference, and that announcement was being made in the context of the conference. I have colleagues uh, involved literally now um, in, in that conference who could be better placed to answer your question. So, in short, um, we are... Um, very happy with this with, with this reduction, um, and, and we see this as, as a positive way forward, and we're promoting it um, um, uh, appropriately through our websites. Of course, um, communities and others um, will, will have their own perspectives, and we work in collaboration always, including with manufacturers, to achieve the best ways forward to um, get optimal access. Thanks. Thank you, Andy, very much for this. So let's try to take a uh, as many questions as we can. So let's try with the Wall Street Journal. We have Denise Roland with us. Denise. Hi, thanks for taking my question. Uh, I've got two on monkeypox. One is um, in this narrower group of people who who should be targeted for vaccination is high risk group for exposure. What's your best estimate for the number of people in that group? In other words, you know, how many doses does the world need to vaccinate all the people at high risk of exposure in this sort of narrower way, short of a you know mass vaccination campaign? Um, and secondly, is any action underway to expand the manufacture of MVABN either by speeding up the fill and finish of bulk or making more bulk vaccine? Thank you. Uh, thank you. Let's uh, let's go to uh, to Mr. Tim Guyen. Tim. Uh, uh, thank you, um, Denise. Um, the WHO has currently activated uh, our infectious disease modeling uh, network to look uh, exactly at these questions about the global need to serve different intervention strategies, including different forms of vaccination strategies. So as we are looking and gearing towards the results of these uh, experts' consultation, we do do some uh, ballpark estimation on some of these needs to help guide us with our next steps and our planning process. 
So if you look at uh, post-exposure uh, vaccination strategy, uh, basically what we kind of do is uh, extrapolating the number of global cases and uh, multiply by 10 to 20 uh, contacts each of these cases have. So in this context, you know, we are looking right now uh, of 18,000 cases, so this translates into 180,000 to 360,000 uh, vaccine doses for such a strategy. When you're looking at uh, pre-exposure prophylaxis, and depending on what countries define as uh, high-risk groups, uh, including uh, MSM population uh, with high-risk uh, 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 behavior, uh, this could account to currently for the 78 countries that are reporting uh, cases uh, to something between uh, 5 to 10 million doses uh, of uh, uh, vaccine. So these are very uh, preliminary ballpark uh, estimation and we're looking further uh, to um, the modeling studies uh, that uh, we have been uh, uh, commissioning. Now, now when it comes um, uh, to uh, the supply situation, with that later strategy, we know at the moment, if we do this now casting, there is not enough uh, vaccine in fill and finish form. Uh, to serve such a strategy uh, in the current context. So the key, and I think that's what your question has been gearing up, you know, how fast, you know, can uh, um, uh, the, the turn of uh, bulk into fill and finish happen? And this is where we are in constant uh, discussion with manufacturers on expanding uh, uh, or what are their plans in terms of fill and finish capacity. Our understanding, this is now uh, uh, gearing up uh, on the manufacturing side. Uh, here in WHO, we have received offers from different manufacturers to support that fill and finish capacity, and that's based on the WHO uh, and the DG call for those uh, intensified action to happen after the declaration of the public health emergency of international concern. So this is where we are trying to match those offers that are coming in and uh, providing uh, these offers also to the current manufacturing capacity. Thank you. Dr. Swaminathan, would you like to add? So very quickly, I think Tim has covered most of it, but we are in discussions with the manufacturers um, to, uh, to do a couple of things. The first one is to get an uh, idea of the availability of uh, doses, the, com the finished ones that can be used immediately. Um, many of them have been committed to countries already as countries are purchasing these uh, doses from the, from the companies, so we would also like to to explore the possibility of a donation from uh, the countries that have already booked or purchased doses so that they could be put into a stockpile for countries that do not have currently any access to vaccines and also for research uh, use. As, because as I said earlier, we, there is a need to generate data. Uh, and then the second one we're exploring is on the fill and finish because companies have, uh, Bavarian Nordic has bulk and uh, it would be uh, maybe possible to get some other companies to support them in the fill and finish process. And then the third uh, is the longer term uh, needs, particularly for uh, the countries where, this, uh, where monkeypox has been spreading for the last several decades, uh, where a vaccination strategy again is, is, is being thought about. Again, it needs more thinking, it needs more data, it needs more research, it needs better surveillance. But in the, in the case that uh, such a vaccine may be used in the population, we will need then to think about technology transfer, manufacturing on a wider scale. And this is where, again, the whole initiative of technology transfer, of distributed manufacturing, of enabling local manufacturers to produce vaccines for endemic diseases, and also bringing the cost down to make it more affordable and accessible. I think this is a test, again, for some of the lessons we learned from COVID, Monkeypox right now, luckily, is not killing uh, people, but we don't know. We have to prepare for the future for this and other uh, pathogens. And this is where we have an opportunity now to look at how R&D and manufacturing, uh, particularly for these uh, pathogens, which can cause sudden uh, epidemics and pandemics, how does the world actually work together to address a situation where there is shortage, limited supplies, and, and the demand may actually outstrip the, the supplies very quickly. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Swaminathan. Uh, let's uh, move on. Uh, we have Erin Prater from uh, uh, Fortune. Erin, 
Can you please unmute yourself? Yes, thank you so much for taking my question. Just curious if there's been any kind of update in the evolution of the monkeypox virus. I believe several weeks ago, CDC officials uh, said that at least two different strains of the West African clade had been identified in the US. Any update on that? Thank you. Who would like, uh, maybe Dr. Lewis can st start? Sure. So, uh, indeed, there are a couple of studies coming out now. There was another one this week. Um, these are very early days yet for these types of studies. Uh, the clades of the viruses, as you know, go back many years, go back 70 years. Um, and then the West African clade, or clade 2, um, has appeared, has always been there, but uh, has appeared uh, more frequently since 2017. But there are extended gaps uh, both uh, in the time frames during which sequencing was done, as well as uh, there are many um, perhaps uh, sequences there that are not yet available. We clearly see that there has been some evolution, but we don't yet know what it means in terms of transmissibility. We don't yet know what it means um, in terms of um, how the disease manifests uh, when someone is infected with the virus. Um, however, uh, what we can uh, certainly say is that the longer the virus continues to circulate, the more opportunity it does have uh, to continue to um, modify to be modified or to mutate uh, and to develop new genotypic or phenotypic features. So again, it's critically important to slow down this spread uh, for that reason, as well as any other reason of protecting uh, people and, and communities. Um, but also, as we still don't know a lot about what is, uh, this virus is doing right now, it's another reason to uh, really make every effort to stop the outbreak, um, because as long as it continues to spread, it will have further opportunities uh, to adapt to the human population. Uh, and just maybe to build on, on that point uh, and the point that Sami made, uh, we, we do have to break this cycle of having these reactive approaches to the emergence of these diseases in new populations. Um, we, uh, many, many people, uh, Rosamund and many others work in WHO and in many scientific institutions around the world, and they work on these diseases you know, over decades, and they maintain a body of knowledge, and they struggle to get research money, they struggle to get the necessary resources. Uh, manufacturers have big costs in developing these niche products, because they have to go through the whole process for what is a product that may not have a, a, a big market. So there are real deficits in how we're looking at this, in terms of scanning the horizon and seeing the risks coming before it comes over the hill. Now we're reacting when the problem is amongst us, uh, and causing major problems. And then that's when we end up having to scramble collectively, scramble scientifically, scramble from a, from, a, from a manufacturing point of view, scramble from a communications point of view. We need to stop scrambling so much. Uh, we need to be in a much stronger position with pox viruses, flu viruses, coronaviruses, phyloviruses. Uh, some of you will be repeating our, uh, uh, our pathogen prioritization process in, in the coming months. We need to take this seriously. When we sit together as a global community and we prioritize pathogens for the future, that's not just about waving a flag. That, that, that's about investing up front in the science, in the research, in building countermeasures. It will cost money, and it does cost money. But it is a fantastic investment in protecting us down the line. And a dollar spent on preparedness is worth a thousand dollars spent on response. And I think we need to really take a much more systematic look at how we prioritize pathogens for the future and then how we invest. So when these things come along, we're not having to deal with limited availability of diagnostics, limited availability of antivirals, limited availability of vaccines, because this will just repeat, repeat, and we will live, die, repeat on this unless we take control. And I believe we have, for the first time in human history, the science and the cohesion, I hope, to take these things more seriously, more systematically, and we need a decades of run-up to many of these diseases in order to have the necessary countermeasures in place. So, and Dr. Tedros has called for this in pandemic preparedness and response, to really get the focus back on preparing, on being ready. Yes, continuing to respond well, but continuing to respond well to these events, making up for gaps that exist, systematic gaps and weaknesses in our health system, systematic gaps in our diagnostics, systematic gaps in our manufacturing capacity, systematic gaps in our fairness and equity. These will just continue to repeat themselves. So I do think as we sit today with uh, 
COVID, with monkeypox, with Marburg, uh, with polio, we need to realise that this is not stopping and we need to be much more considered, measured and strategic in our approach. And this is what Tedros has been calling for. He's been calling for this for a very long time, long before COVID came, long before COVID came. Uh, and, and it's time for us all to, to, to be much more directed and systematic in how we deal with these diseases. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rand. So maybe we'll take one last question. We are already uh, beyond the hour, and there are still many questions, but I will invite all those uh, whose questions uh, we didn't have a time to answer to come to media team, and we will try to, to, uh, to uh, answer, answer each one of them. So let's, let's go to Gabriela Sotomayor uh, from Processo for the last question today. Gabriela. Hola, thank you. Thank you very much for taking my question. Um, so what, what are your main concerns uh, regarding monkeypox in children? I understand that the disease can be very serious for them. And then a question for Dr. Tedros. Uh, what do you recommend to countries uh, from Latin America, for example, like Mexico, with few cases? The outbreak is being underestimated, which is not even remotely like COVID. There is no comparison, comparison, but Mexico is one of the countries with the highest number of deaths because they did not take COVID seriously. So what is Dr. Tedros' recommendation in this case, these countries? Thank you. Uh, thank you, thank you, Gabriela. We will try uh, to answer the question about children first. Uh, Dr. Lewis. Thank you, Gabriela. Uh, what we've known from monkeypox research in the past is that children uh, are at higher risk of severe disease. That does not mean that every child that contracts uh, monkeypox virus infection will develop severe disease. Uh, there is, of course, a range of clinical manifestations like there are with most infectious diseases. Uh, however, it does mean that there is a preponderance of uh, children, pregnant women, and immune compromised persons amongst those who do develop uh, severe disease. So a child um, can develop, for example, if the, if the rash is very extensive, um, there can be fluid loss, the child can become dehydrated. Also, you know that the lymph nodes are predominantly uh, often, in both the classic and the current forms that we're seeing, appear on the neck, and these lymph nodes can become significantly enlarged and um, make it difficult to swallow, which also can contribute to uh, dehydration. There can be severe pain in the, in the mouth and throat, which contributes to difficulty eating. Uh, so nutritional status, maintaining hydration, nutritional status is really critically important for children who do become quite ill. Uh, taking care of the rash is important for children uh, who develop a uh, significant rash. And uh, of course, monkeypox can also affect the other um, mucosal uh, surfaces, especially in including the eyes. And certainly in the African setting, we've seen a number of people who develop scarring over the cornea become and become uh, blind due to monkeypox uh, because of the the, um, the lesions that appear in the eyes and on the cornea. So there are a number of other things that can happen. Uh, we're starting to see a few cases of encephalitis, which is inflammation of the brain. Um, this has been reported in the past, and, and so uh, we want to do everything we can to keep uh, everyone safe, of course, uh, but if um, a young child or uh, a pregnant woman may also um, have consequences uh, that are through having the virus during pregnancy. So these are people who are vulnerable either because of their particular, um, their age, their, their, their status, uh, they may uh, have, others may have immune compromise, and children are still building their immunity, um, and others may have their immunity compromised, whether through pregnancy, whether through untreated HIV, whether through chemotherapy, whether through other immunosuppressive treatments. So these are some of the things that we look for, and these are some of the things that we want to guard against um, and, and protect vulnerable people during this outbreak. Over to you, Dr. Mike. Ryan. Um, uh, just briefly, Anna, uh, you're correct. This, this is not COVID. Uh, monkeypox is not COVID. But it is still a serious event that requires scaled up and intensified action um, because we don't know the future. Uh, and there are enough uncertainties here. Uh, and this is deeply affecting one very important part of our community as well. Uh, and we need to show that solidarity that we'd expected. Uh, to be shown to all parts of our community. So this is, and Dr. Tedros has called uh, on this. We've maintained under Dr. Tedros's leadership activities on monkeypox and smallpox right for, 
right the way through COVID, through the leadership of people like Rosamond here, keeping scientific committees working, keeping the research community moving on this process. Um, secondly, when Dr. Tedros called the committee together for the first time, he was reaching out and alerting the world that this is a problem, it's on the table, and we're looking at it closely. Bringing the committee back together again, and then issuing uh, his uh, declaration of a fake uh, is a call to action, and it is a call specifically to action by member states all over the world. Um, with the specific reference uh, to Mexico, many countries have had uh, the good and the bad of COVID. No country can stand up and say we've been perfect. No country is in a situation where it did everything terribly. Uh, we all struggle collectively to, to meet the challenge that, uh, that uh, COVID has brought uh, to our communities. Um, uh, so from that perspective, I think Dr. Tedros is saying to every country, including Mexico, monkeypox is an issue. It requires intensified, coordinated response. It requires us to beef up diagnostics, surveillance, communication, and most importantly, open, transparent, sensitive communications with all parts of our community. This is the way for this disease to be contained and controlled. That needs to happen everywhere, everywhere, in every country, including Mexico. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Lewis and Dr. Ryan, for uh, answering this uh, last question for today. We will uh, send uh, audio and video files of this press briefing later in the evening, and hopefully transcript will be available tomorrow. With this, uh, I will give the floor to Dr. Tedros for his closing remarks. Thank you. Thank you, Tariq. And I would like to thank all uh, colleagues uh, from the press who have joined today, and see you next time. <laughs>